Hey, everyone. Just wanted to take a moment to thank you for listening to the show. We're thrilled that you're here and enjoying the content. This podcast is completely free for you, but if you'd ever consider supporting the show, we truly appreciate it. One way you can do that is by using our affiliate links. These are links to products and services that we've mentioned on the show. And if you make a purchase through one of them, we might earn a small commission at no extra cost to you. It's a great way to show your love for the podcast and help us keep creating awesome content. Blah, 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 blah. Welcome to the Our Forever Smiles podcast, a podcast created to support mothers of children who were born with clefts and those who love them. I'm your host, Laura Arroyo, and I'm also a mother of a daughter who was born with a surprise cleft palate. I know the challenges you face every day. Whether you have just learned the difficult news of your baby's cleft lip or palate, you're in the midst of pre-op or post-op, or you're an OG cleft mom, this podcast is for you. In a weekly conversation, we will talk about everything from feeding and speech therapy to surgery and school. We'll share tips from guest experts and advocates and even share a little joy in the process. You can listen to Our Forever Smiles wherever you listen to podcasts. Don't forget to subscribe and stay tuned. Hello, and welcome back to the Our Forever Smiles Cleft Mom Diaries and Support Podcast. I am Laura Arroyo. Before we jump into this episode, I would like to invite you to join this community to hear conversations with other cleft moms and advocates that will help you feel supported along your journey. All I want you to do is click on the Facebook group page that is linked in the episode notes. You can speak directly to the guests from this podcast, ask questions, and talk to a community of cleft moms that are eager for answers, but also willing to help. As a note, we are not medical doctors, and we do not intend for you to use information that we share here as medical advice. We are parents and advocates who love our children, and we're sharing our own personal experiences. Today, we have a lot of tips for you all, as this is the palate repair episode. We know that in many of our groups, people have endless questions about palate repair. It is something that I think a lot of us moms get really nervous for <laughs> as it is one of the bigger surgeries that our little ones have to have. So I decided to bring Gina on again. Gina's like a recurring guest now. <laughs> I'm just so excited to have her here. Welcome, Gina. Thanks so much. I'm so happy to be talking to you again. Me too. So I have a little update. I mentioned the Facebook group in the intro, my usual intro that I always have. I got some really exciting news this week. So I don't really know quite how I'm going to work this out, but I haven't thought this all the way through. But there was a cleft, pa cleft lip and palate support group that was on Facebook that had about 5,000 members in it. And that Facebook group was public and it was filled with parents asking questions and, and that sort of thing, but also lots and lots of spam. So I think that whoever the, I don't think I know because I spoke with her, the admin of that page, her son, Zach, her name is Joanne. He is now 18 and she started the page when like long ago, like when he was younger and she just forgot about it or just stopped <laughs> managing it. And so lucky me, right? I reached out to her because she sent a message in the group and she said, I forgot about this page. Sorry for all of the spam. If someone is wants to be an admin of this group, willing to have someone else take it over. So of course I'm like, okay, let's jump on this opportunity, right? Like it has 5,000 members in it. And of course we want to make sure that we get our stories out there and also just help other moms listen to our stories so that they can feel empowered and validated and all the wonderful things. And so she basically gave me all of the admin rights to that group. And I am able to share and everyone 
is able to yeah. talk in that group. So just so excited that just had the opportunity to do that. And she's so sweet and yeah. she yeah. will be on the podcast. And her son, Zach, is 18 and he's he had a Tessier cleft which is a little bit different than the quote unquote usual, right? Clef lip and, and palate journey. Yeah. His journey is longer, more severe. And, and so we'll, we will also keep him in thoughts and prayers as he goes through orthodontic work currently is what he is working on. And just going into his teens or actually going into young adulthood. So yeah, we'll keep him in prayer. So that's just really exciting news. I don't know what to do. I'm not sure whether I should like direct people to the this new Facebook group or whether I should keep the old one. So I'm, yeah. it's just, I got to think about strategy there. But yeah. Yeah. That's exciting. <laughs> just a little carrot dropped on your, on your plate. That's great. Yeah, it's it just, great. It reminds me of all the things that we, you know, I, Gina and I were finally able to connect in person at CliffCon, but just, it just is a, one more thing that just makes me feel like I'm on the right track and I'm doing the right thing and living in my purpose. So, yeah. That's such a good feeling. Yeah. Feel well. So that's my good news. I think Gina has good news to share. I have great news. Yes. So many little bits of things that have happened over the last two weeks. We had two really big appointments. As a little refresher, my daughter, Brianna, had her palate repair at 11 months in March. She was healing and they basically said, we'll see you for a speech eval at 15 months. And it was a long evaluation at her children's hospital. She did like a formal assessment, which I was like geeking out because I have a degree in early childhood language intervention or acquisition and things like that. So we were like talking all the, all the just phonemic awareness, all just like loving it. And Brianna scored really high, like way higher than her SLP thought that she would in all areas. And um, even though she had a little, they call it a little blip in the back of her palate that didn't quite close all the way. It came open during recovery. It's not affecting her speech. So that was like the biggest win because it was based on the evaluation. We'll see if we had to go back in right away first to do palate repair again, or if we can wait and maybe close it later, like at a bone graft when she's much older. So that was a huge win. And then yesterday we met with her surgeon and she like walked in and was like, I have great news. Like after talking to the SLP and after looking in her mouth and everything, like we, we all can agree that we're not going back into surgery right away because she, her palate is functioning as it should be, both her soft and hard palates. It was just like a little bit of leftover tissue, it seems like, that just split open. So like I can see it in the back of her mind or in the back of her mouth. But besides that, yeah, so that's really good news. We're going to keep going to speech every six months just to double check. And they taught me what to to look for and notice. And then one of my really good friends is an SLP as well. So it's just nice to feel like I am really supported and knowing what to look for in case we do have to go back in to repair that part. But for now, I'm just celebrating that win. So it feels really good. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Sorry to interrupt, but I need a little bit of help. If you're listening to this on the Apple Podcast app or YouTube, you may see a follow plus sign or a subscribe button. If you're able to, it would mean the world to me if you could follow or subscribe. That's the best way to support this show. If you subscribe, I'm able to show it to potential guests or different brands. It helps to grow the show and reach more communities to continue building awareness about the cleft lip and palate journey on a global scale. Thank you so, so much. Back to the conversation. I'm so Got to take all the celebration. Yeah, no, I'm so excited for that. It's so, so interesting, though, because, okay, has it closed more since you've seen it or... No, it's still really open. It's weird. It's t I thought it was her uvula that was split, but it's like next to her uvula. Her uvula is intact, but it's, I don't know. I think they don't really know what happened. The surgeon was like something I did. It's nothing you guys did. It just, I think her body like went back to trying to be open mm -hmm. a little bit. Hers was very wide. Like she had to do extra maneuvers to try to close it. And they, they tried to get it not too tight when they're closing it because that can cause problems and not too loose, but it's functioning. So that's all that I worry about. Mm. Thankful. 
for that. So yeah, yeah, that's because that's the immediate thing that I was thinking about. Because they talk about like the seal, right? So when I'm thinking about it yeah. being open, it must not be directly in the back. That's what I was just like it's thinking. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's sealed, and then there was like a little extra in the front of the seal. Uh -huh. So wow, just holding the 15 month old to open their mouth for a long time that struggles. It's been hard to, but you can visually see it, like when she laughs or when she cries. So it's very noticeable. But um. I guess she's working around it and they're so amazing. Like the things that these kids learn how to manage and go through. And it just is such a good lesson for all of us on like resiliency. And I just, so she's able, she's making all the sounds of the pressure with the suction. Everything's going great. Soon as we were one week post-op when they found it. And I was just so defeated because here we are she's still on the liquid only she's still having to use the arm restraints and they're like we'll talk about rescheduling another one in six months and i was like no so to hear that it worked was really just like a miracle yeah i love that i think yeah i feel i remember you were talking on your instagram about just you're so ready for that next appointment and they're like oh like you're good to go and it's like, oh no that Wait. was weird yeah. <laughs> yeah that was the thing you told us was we've been going well, for her NAM appointment, we started when she was four days old and we went once or twice a week for an adjustment. And for us, it's like an hour to an hour and a half each way. And then you're in the big city with parking and it's just not easy to navigate and all that stuff. And so then we're just so used to going every week and it slowed down a little bit after some of her surgeries, but they still, we still were going a lot for hearing assessments and all that stuff. And yeah, after the appointment yesterday, they were like, we'll send you a postcard in a year. And I was like, a postcard? Are you kidding me? I lived here. You're sending a postcard? So it was just so funny. And I was like, they wouldn't even let me make an appointment. And I'm like, I'm so used to having like five appointments on the books. And so they were like, yeah, you graduated from your first year. And this is the most intense year. Congratulations. And I, I just still, it doesn't feel real yet. We're like 24 hours out of that. And it's just know what to do with myself. And just met, like mentally releasing that was really huge for us too. It's, it's a hard first year emotionally, mentally, physically, everything. So to be on the other side of that, everyone said it would get easier in the groups. And I, it's hard to believe in the moment. But once you're on the other side, you're like, okay, going to get easier. Yeah. I remember Giselle's last appointment. I also had Giselle, I had her evaluated for speech twice just because I didn't. I was like, there's no way this is what you all told me was like next. And I feel like you all don't get it. Yeah. I feel like nobody is understanding that she has a cleft and she needs to go to speech. And then <laughs> there's the SLP that was actually yeah, her all team club. She's no, Laura. It's only as needed. If she, if the repair is yeah. working, that's good. She's not going to need to have speech. And she's, and if you're really worried, we are going to evaluate her every year. And I was like, yeah, that you are so right. I am going to be here at least once a year. To I just want you to have that. Yeah. yeah. They were like, we don't want you to fall through the cracks. And, th and they said, like, if you don't show up, they'll call you, figure out where you are, where you went. And stuff like that. And I was like, oh, there's no way we're falling through the cracks. But I'm good. I like, I'm going to be here. But it is hard. So she with three kids can understand how people just are like, well, we don't need to go. She's doing fine. No. Yeah, no, I would caution people to that, too. And we're actually going to talk about that next as well. But but just, yeah, no, just after that appointment that we had with Giselle, she, she was like, there's this long bridge to get to the parking deck. And she was like running across the bridge. And I was just like, I had this moment of like relief. Like, this is the first time that I've felt like, okay, she's okay. Like I, I hadn't had that in so since she was born. And I don't, it was just such a weird, like this feeling about just watching her like run, baby. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so powerful. I know. And sometimes you need those reminders along the way because it is a long journey. And I think I have been caught up. I caught myself getting caught up in all the what ifs and what's next. And so when I'm saying like, what's next? And they're like, let's talk about it at your appointment next year. And I was like, what? And so it is a good reminder to just try to be present in the day to day and not get so caught up because from right from 20 week anatomy ultrasound for us, I know you guys didn't find out at the anatomy ultrasound, but like for us, I've been worried since December of 2022 
about her speech and then to have the speech teacher be like, oh, no, she's like way above where I'm like, I've been worried about this for years and and just grateful. And it is helpful to have other moms along the journey with you to be able to talk about stuff like this. Yeah. And just speaking of falling through the cracks, one of the things that I actually learned, and I don't know if this is the case in Texas as well. I'm in North Carolina. Um, Gina and I are, are both in the United States. But I know with like insurance, and I don't know if you want to speak on the updates with insurance, but I what, from what I've learned from speaking to other moms in the United States is that if you have a year, if you don't go to that annual appointment, some insurance companies will say, you you oh. are no longer you're not along the cleft journey you know what i mean like they qualify right. you and say that it's cause they yeah. start trying to say it's cosmetic at that point oh. and corinne oh, yeah. told me about that she said sometimes and she's older she's an adult and all, but she said sometimes she'll just make an appointment just to make sure that she's yeah. covered and go get like a consultation or whatever just to she like played her game and and yeah but i don't know if you want to give an update about your insurance journey as well I'm just, yeah, I'll be very, I'll try to keep it very quick. And always like my DMs are always open. I talk to new class moms every single day. So um, you can find me on Instagram as the celebrating mama. If you want to talk about this more, because I'm actually helping some other moms through their insurance battle right now. But unfortunately, cleft care is not easy for insurance. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that it's just in the mouth and medical insurance in the United States, like they'll see, med- they see it in the mouth and they think dental and they want to try to push it to dental. So that's what happened with us as far as her palate repair being denied. Um, because hers was so wide, and I just talked to the surgeon about this a while yesterday, she had to do a couple different steps, not just like there's one code that most surgeons use for the palate repair. She used two codes. And one of those codes just kicks back as a dental code, even though it is a medical code. And so we, I had to fight it really long. I just kept calling. And I finally just said, like, hey, is there any way I can talk to a nurse or a doctor who could understand this more? And just to explain it, because I felt like they must cut, like this is for her to eat and breathe. And this is very medical. This is not something that is a revision. This is her first closing of her palate. And they denied it after the surgeon's letter. They denied it after I asked for someone else to re-review it. So this is like multiple denials. And then I finally got someone who would listen to me, who was, um, who passed it to someone else. And she was born with a cleft. And she was like, okay, I'm going to take this under control. So then she paired up with another woman who also worked at my insurance who was, uh, had a cleft affected person in her family mm. and they took it among themselves. Like not, I, this is way more than I would have ever imagined to hear our story, to have sympathy and realize the system was broken. So they decided they were going to change the whole cleft coverage nationally for United Healthcare for, because of what we had to go through for so many months to just try to get this surgery paid for. Anyway, they called me to thank me. They sent Brianna a gift, like a book and a bear. It was so sweet. I just got it in the mail. It was so sweet. And they said, like, we, they told me their names. They, like, really wanted me to know how moved they were that I, and they're like, this is not right. You should not have to fight this. So they said, just so you know, it's very important for us to tell you that future families will not go through this. And that I was like crying on the phone. Thank you so much. That's all I wanted. I said that we did everything. We went in network. We notified you ahead of time. We did all the things. We paid our out-of-pocket maximum. We did everything we should have. And so it was just frustrating. And I, luckily, the part that was denied was only 6000 But there was 20000 on top of that that they're still negotiating. Mm-hmm. And so I was not wanting to pay $26,000 on top of already paying. Like, mm-hmm. eight. So I wanted to fight it because I knew that other people, even though we might be able to afford, you know, to pay for it out of pocket, I know a lot of people could not. And so to hear that they were changing the policy really meant a lot. And um, unfortunately, it's very common. And one little tip, the first tip I wanted to give because this is something I learned the, the hard way. So I asked for it to be prior authorized by the person who called me to verify the surgery. 
She's oh, yeah. But I didn't have a copy of it in hand with the codes they were going to use and the fact that it was prior authorized. And when I called my insurance and I said, this was prior authorized, they're like, I nope, they never fit, submitted mm-hmm. that, which they didn't have to. It wasn't like with our insurance, like whatever. But they said, oh, well, if they would have prior authorized it, then we wouldn't, it would automatically be approved. And this denial would have been overturned. And I was like, oh, so three months of me fighting. If someone at the hospital would have just sent that form in, they said they did. There's a lot of people who it's through the medical port of the pa- the parents can't do anything about it. It has to be done from the hospital. But as a parent, before you go in surgery, you can say, I need to see a copy of the prior authorization or a prior approval, whatever. And that is that's what they told me next time. However, it's not just because you have the prior authorization doesn't mean it's going to be approved. Yeah. Uh, so it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be approved, but it is helpful when you're fighting it, which is at least at my insurance companies. And they're one of the largest in the country. So it's just helpful to know, like the next surgery, I'll make sure that I know what codes are used ahead of time because the surgeon knew what codes she was going to use and I would they would have known that it would have been done. It's, anyway, yeah, that was just a little update on that. But don't give up fighting. <laughs> I had sent nurse calling, representatives from I, our, like our district called because there is cleft coverage insurance. It's like in the insurance code of Texas. So that's another way you can look up your state insurance code. But I did find out that not all states or not all insurance companies have to follow the state insurance code. If they're like a national insurance branch, Mm -hmm. they follow federal codes, which is not the state codes. And the federal code, there's currently nothing for cleft coverage, which is why we need ELSA to get passed. That bill ELSA would be a federal coverage for all children with congenital abnormalities to get their surgeries covered. I think that's a really big win. And um, of course, we want Elsa to pass as well. So please, if you're listening to this episode this week, please, I will link the form that you can use to send to your representatives so that you can advocate for Elsa to get passed. I think there's, we can still do that, right? There's still time for, oh yeah, I think, yeah, they're still introducing it. I don't think it's been introduced yet. They're still like rewriting it right now. And I will say it is very empowering if you've never called your state, like start with their lo- your most local person. Like I did my House of Representative, who just is like our tiny little area of Texas. Um, they answer on the first ring and they were like super nice. And they were like, this is so interesting. Like, thank you so much for telling me. Like they wanted to know all about it. And like, all you have to say is like, I believe that kids who are born with congenital abnormalities deserve coverage yeah by their insurance company like the insurance that we pay for as like citizens anyway she thought it was really interesting and now he's like gonna get involved and stuff if you've never called your representative that their job is to help pursue things that you're interested in so if you don't speak up then somebody else will about another issue and so it's important to make your voice heard yeah i love that that's our first tip for this episode Great update from Gina and yeah. just so grateful actually to have all of the incredible work that she's doing because obviously, you know, our voices are making a difference in this. So this episode, as we shared earlier, is going to be the palate repair episode. So we have lots of tips and tricks for all those mamas out there that are going into palate repair. Yes. I don't know. I'll just speak for myself. Yes. It, I feel like it's scary territory, but you will get through it and it's not really I don't know what do you think Gina it's not as bad as what people make it out to be yeah this is another thing that I worried about for a very long time because I I don't know I feel on the groups that everyone says palate repair is like worse than lip repair and things like that so I, lip repair was already hard and it's emotional so to think oh this is worse but we actually I talked to my husband about this recording this episode today and he agreed that For us, lip repair was much more difficult. And so I know not everyone goes through both, but if you are a mama or a dad or going through both, just know for us, there was lots of reasons why lip repair was more challenging. They're younger. It's more emotional. You're giving your baby over, at least for us, it was our first time to give our baby over for surgery. So that was really hard. It was really hard not knowing what to expect recovery wise. It was hard because she was younger. She couldn't use as many pain meds. She was under six months, so she couldn't use. We couldn't alternate Tylenol and ibuprofen. 
and just the emotional difficulty of like, giving your baby over with how she looks and then giving it getting a baby back that doesn't look the same is way more challenging. And so if you have been through that, just know that you will get through power repair and that it is, you know, I thought easier that I would have I wish I would have heard someone say that before power repair because I was just terrified. Yes, it's not easy and it's hard that it's inside their mouth, but there are ways to help. And those are some tips that we have. And of course, okay. we keep these anonymous because the groups are private. Right. Okay. Maybe we can answer this one. <laughs> Our surgeon talked us through the furlough Z plasty and the P flap surgery. We are leaning towards the Z plasty if she's just eligible. Can anyone speak to their experience with the surgery and the age of the surgery? She will be three and a half around possible surgery time. Did anyone have it sooner? What was recovery like? Do you know anything so about that? Yeah, that's the surgery that that's like a palate lengthening surgery. And that's all I know about that is that obviously the surgeons are the ones that choose which one to do, because I was like, I think Brianna might need this. And she, the surgeon's like, all right, mom, I think I got it. <laughs> but well, so all I know about that is as they grow, like from little babies to like three-year-olds, a lot of times their mouths will get bigger, obviously, and their palate might need to, it might not grow along with it kind of thing. They said it just depends on every kid. And and so that kind of like the seal isn't there kind of thing with that because it's like not connected and stuff as much. So I, that's a surgery we're still like could need. A lot of it has to do with an air escaping out of your nose. Like you can cut the hypernasal sounding, things like that. So, um, yeah, I know different surgeons have different ones they like based on the issues. And a lot of people will get like a scope done um, down their throat and things like that to determine which one they need. So I know some moms said, we thought we needed this. We did the scope. We actually need this one uh, surgery wise. And that's like a speech surgery that usually they do around three, three or four. So that's what is still on our maybe. But as of right now, we don't need it. But she was like, you could need it in like a month. It could not need the surgery, but we could notice that. Right. You know, it's. Yeah. And I think a lot of it has to do with what they told is there's a lot of scar tissue in the mouth from the surgery. So as the mouth is growing, the scar tissue doesn't it doesn't keep up as much as a kid who doesn't have scar tissue in their mouth. So, yeah. So but I'm not sure if you're wondering why I've actually invited Gina for this is because, first of all, Gina researches everything. So she's so knowledgeable. <laughs> so there's no shocker that she went to her no, surgery. No, no. Yeah, like, <laughs> telling them what incision they needed to do. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm sorry. Luckily, she like is great, and she just like, gives it right back to me. So <laughs> it was so fun. I she's like, I went to school for 17 years for this, and I was like, okay, I've been researching a lot. I've been I've been researching for seven months, right? Yeah. <laughs> um. Yeah. No, yeah. it's so funny. We we had uh, Dr. Rachel Rotolo on. I think I asked her something about, I think I asked her about that, like the different incisions. And I, I don't have video available right now, but she looked at me like, do you really want to know that? Like the look on her face is like, do you really care about that? I think you, you don't want to gauge someone's like level of knowledge. So she just like, ran down this these lists of like options and yeah. she just looked at me and I'm just like, okay, thanks for the info. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I know. Okay, so what? I have another one. So how long was your hospital stay with cleft palate surgery? Great question. And what they told me is it is 23 to 24 hours after she comes out of surgery. So they like literally started a little stop clock when she had oxygen. I want to monitor their oxygen. And as soon as she got out of recovery, her surgery, we were there at 630 in the morning. I think her surgery was done at noon. And so from noon, we were there the next day until noon. We left right at that noon time. And so they also, they have certain requirements where they want you to drink a certain amount of fluid uh, and then definitely make sure that you don't have any oxygen like dips, which we didn't have any oxygen dips. And she was able to drink the fluid that was required. And we did a lot of turning her IV off in the morning to help encourage her to drink because she was getting so much fluid she wasn't thirsty mm -hmm. so that helped us the next morning 
and then using like syringes, open cups, and her approved sippy cap that she we had trained her on. And so that is how we were able to go home. Um, first day, they told us like, don't worry about stressing about getting fluids in or anything. And so we just let her do whatever she was going to do. And just like, we didn't worry about. And then that next morning um, is when we started trying to drink. And um, she did a lot better than I thought she was going to do, considering if I burn my mouth on pizza, I'm like, oh, I don't want to. Here she is, that whole reconstruction. And she was just ready to do it. Yeah. So. So we stayed, goodness, some of this stuff is like such a blur too because of the sleep. And we'll talk a, a little bit about that as well. But we stayed. So she had surgery in the morning. She was the first patient. And she was at a recovery early as well. We stayed. Yeah, I think probably we were probably out of there by 10 a.m. the next day. She saw us really early and I was bugging the nurse. The surgeon saw us really early in the morning. She said, the nurse was really honest with us. She said, she's either going to, if she doesn't see you early in the morning, the surgeon, if she doesn't come back and see you the next day early in the morning, then you're not going to see her until the afternoon. <laughs> and so we yeah, were like, yeah. please tell her to come by because it was a rough night. Oh my goodness. And I think there's been, I've seen other questions about what the room is like. So for us, again, I'm in North Carolina. I was actually in a, in a very big university hospital. She was at UNC. And yes, they had like one thing that kind of like turned into like this sofa type thing. And then they had one recliner. And then they had like the crib bed for Giselle. But so yeah, that was just all that we had there. I, re I saw recently someone asked in the groups if they could manage it by themselves. And so what's yeah. your um, opinion on it too? Yeah, I... So we did it a little different based on some suggestions from some of my friends that I had talked to. We asked to forego the crib and asked for a bed. And they actually suggested it too the, at the hospital. And so what we, because I knew Brianna was in pain. She was going to want to be held. She was going to want to be up. She wasn't going to want to be in a crib. Like I just had known from her lip repair. And so my husband and I both came and we took turns like every three hours is when we gave medicine. So each of us would sleep in the bed for three hours. So like my husband would sleep for three hours and I would hold her up and I would like, watch a show and then we'd switch and I would sleep for three hours and he would hold her up for those three hours. So that's how we got through our first night tag teaming it that way. And that worked well for us. So I we got a few shifts of three hours sleeping. But I think managing it by yourself, we did have some really active and helpful nurses that came in and helped us a lot. I don't know that it's a hard first night. I know a lot of people did it during COVID. There was no other option. It was only one parent. So a lot of people have done it with only one parent. I know that like we came home that first day and I had my parents watching my other two kids and I thought they were going to have to keep them for like three or four days. But we were doing so well. Brianna was doing so well that we just brought all of our kids back. And so I was, my husband went back to work. So like I was watching Brianna with my two other kids by myself and it was fine. But I know I saw someone ask about that. I think it's definitely doable and a lot of people do it, especially if you don't have any other options. You just make it work and maybe just ask to lean on the staff more to try to like have them check on you or bring you things. We have, it's always good to ask them for, they can get you whatever you would need. They're not so busy, but it's really hard to be by yourself through that. Yeah. That is genius. So the bed, I, now I'm looking, even thinking back and I'm like, I should have did that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't know. We were, I had a lot of people recommend it. And so we just decided to try it. And I'd seen her like in the crib before and she just was like standing up and just not wanting to like sleep in it. So it wouldn't have been helpful for her to sleep by herself anyway. When you, I mean, and they had talked to us about how obviously when you lay down, you know, the blood flows and things like that. And it's already so swollen, it can be more uncomfortable. So us holding her up to sleep was, you know, helping with that the swelling and stuff like that too so yeah that's just how we did it oh that's really cool yeah that's a great tip okay this is a big one that everyone asks all the time what should i pack for cleft palate surgery next week to take to the hospital yeah that one 
I, I think I read like 35 different answers on that when I was researching it for myself, just going in the groups and searching. I think for us, I wanted to make sure that I was as comfortable as possible during the time so I could support her dark clothing because of the, the blood and things like that. We brought her on pillows. I brought blankets for myself, her special levy that she likes, her special blanket that she likes, just really comfortable clothes for us. And then we... Sometimes she likes to loves music. And so I brought an iPad that was pre-downloaded with different little baby bum on Netflix and some Miss Rachel that we could use in case to try to distract her to eat. And that really helped just like the music would calm her down. And um, then, of course, like all the sippy cups that you've tried before that like your surgeon approves. Um, and I always say all the snacks like that for the adult, like healthy snacks, like protein bars, protein shakes, but then also like crunchy, like snacky, enjoyable food. That is what kind of helped keep me up. And especially if you're staying up all night, you always get really hungry and you can't like for us, the cafeteria was really far away. I got lost every time trying to get there and it closed and I was like, I'm starving at 2 a.m. And there's not, I don't want to Uber. I just wanted to have food and popcorn and things like that and then like some uh drinks and things like that too i didn't really i did watch shows for myself to help me stay up like an ipad was helpful the hospital really provides everything you need for the babies Mm -hmm. so i did bring mostly packed stuff for myself mainly the food and like the blankets were really helpful for me (laughs) yeah i think that's one thing that people don't realize as well like that Again, we're speaking to a global audience, but like in the United States, most of the time they the hospital has everything for you. So the diapers, even the diaper wipes, they're going to be in a gown that's provided to them. The only thing that I did do is I did eventually switch her into her own like comfortable onesie. I tried to make it as more like her bedtime routine as much as I could. So I switched her in pajamas that she recognized. I also... She does. She also has a levy. I brought something that like smelled like home, like something from here that she was like close to. And yeah, I I, she has long curly hair. So I just made sure that I put her hair in a ponytail so it was out of the way, like that type of thing, like hair ties and stuff like that. And yeah, that was I just tried to have things that would make her feel like like normalized. Yeah, like as long as she could. Yeah. I did bring some new toys that she hadn't seen before from home, <laughs> like a little light up toy that she could like, push that she really liked. And then also I found out like a- as we were checking out that most, at least children's hospitals in the United States have like toy rooms where you can like, check out toys and like, that are all like cleaned and sanitized and like you- it's fun. So we took her to that room and she could like, it was a really good distraction. So you can, it was like a child life services or something. You can check it out and if, ask your hospital if they have it. But had a lot of the same toys I brought to try to, because you're, especially like the next day, she was like, after she had slept a few times and gotten the um, medicine in, she never used anything except, uh, I think they gave her some morphine. But besides that, after she woke up, it was just Tylenol mm-hmm. and ibuprofen, nothing more intense. And um, she wanted to play. She was like wanting to walk around. And she had the oxygen monitor and then the IV. And so it was hard to keep her from wanting to like climb. Yeah. She was 11 months, very active. And so it was hard to keep her stationary and to not move too far away from the pole of all her stuff. So we did take her on a walk. They had like little cars that she could go in and things like that. So I would just like always ask your hospital too, if there's anything to distract them. Because that, you yeah, know, it's helpful. Yeah, for sure. I feel like forever indebted to the Ronald McDonald house. And they also at times have some like playrooms and stuff set up within the hospital. So yes, for sure. Ask about that. And then also the one thing that I also thought about is the sound machine. So just sell sleep. So the sound machine now. So if you were to bring something like that, I guess you could use it to mask the beeping and that, that sort of like sound. You did mention also, it made me think of this. So any tips on how to get your baby to eat after palate repair? So you mentioned like you use a little bit of toys to distract her. Anything else that you can like help encourage her to eat? Yeah, we had, we would use a syringe first to get her 
like, okay, we're going to try to drink and like squirt it in. And then we would switch to the sippy cup where she could get more in mm-hmm. faster. We had practiced, we had gotten her off bottles 100% before, and then she still really refused it. So I was thinking like, oh, we're, we've planned, we've prepped, like everything, she's going to be good. And then she still really refused it. So don't beat yourself up if that happens because it's nothing you did as far as, because I know a lot of moms are stressed about trying to get them off the bottles before. And we did that and she was off the bottles completely for a month before surgery. And she still had a hard time, which is to be expected is after intense surgery. We did try like apple juice. They, they suggested that. Um, I tried to ask if we could use purees because she loves purees to get some liquid in, but they said that was too thick. They didn't want like any seeds or anything. So anyway, we ended up just doing apple juice and or a formula. We used formula because she was still 11 months. That was helpful to be able to do that. But yeah, I would just say distracting. And then also like she would feed for me sometimes and she wouldn't feed for Brian. And then other times she would feed for my husband and she wouldn't. So just trying to like different scenery, different environments. Sometimes we would do it standing up. We would do it sitting down. Like you just try all the different combinations and don't get frustrated. Just try to be like, okay, let's do the next, let's try the next thing. That was my husband's number one tip was just to have patience because when people are coming in and nurses are like, how many ounces did she drink? And she wasn't drinking that many. It's hard to not get frustrated and feel like, okay, we got to be, you know, and they can see off your energy too. If you're stressed, they feel that. And so we were like, we're just, this is like a little staycation like for us and we're just going to get through it so yeah as a family that's another great tip as well to stay calm especially if you are there with your partner I know like we argued a little bit and I think that yeah like it's like not the time for that (laughs) it's like looking back on like but the other thing that you mentioned as well that I'm really like tired of preaching (laughs) to the choir about is I think so many of us are so worried about weaning off the bottle first and I think it's so important because and I've talked to all of the surgeons that I've spoken to about this are like we just want to we don't want any failures and stuff like that but I think what people aren't recognizing or a lot of moms don't realize is that your baby's probably not going to want anything near their mouth when yes. after it's yes. all said and done. Like they are really, they have a hard time with even the syringe. And so just sure. give yourself yeah. some patience with that. Like I know someone posted the other day about, oh, how do I get them off the passy or that type of thing? Giselle, Giselle's a thumb sucker. She still sucks her thumb. And I thought this was going to be a problem because you can take a passy away and throw it out the window, but this is attached to her. And it was like, I was so stressed out about it. But like when palate repair happened, she was like not even thinking about her thumb. She wanted nothing to do with anything. And just, I think another thing is just take a deep breath. Of course, we're just two women on a podcast talking, right? Follow your doctor's (laughs) orders. But for people that are panicking about this, what were some like best tips or practices that you use to get Brianna off of the bottle? Yeah, so I was one of those people panicking. Our team, so her surgery is the end of March and they wanted us like in January getting her off the bottle. And she was my last baby. I was already like such a huge, like every time I fed her through a bottle, I was grateful because I for so long was worried that she might not take, because they told us she will not be like her palate. So what, this is not a cleft team. This is a different surgeon at our hospital after my fetal MRI was like, she won't be able to take a bottle. And so I was like, so grateful every time. So it was hard for me emotionally to stop like a bottle, like the comfort. It's not the same with the sippy cup. And uh, especially with my last. And so what we did was we would start with like one meal a day. We would like get her to play with it at the at meal times, things like that, just before we would even do it. So I'd put like form, her formula that she liked and stuff in there. And that was just helpful to just like low stress. So we started in January, like low stress for all of us. If you want to take it, we can try getting one. That, we tried a bunch of different ones. And getting one that was free flow, obviously, so that she don't have to make suction because it's not prepared yet. And just finding when they like trying different because each child is so different than just really like we also would start it to try when she was hungry because I felt like it, 
if she had already had a big bottle, she like wasn't going to want to drink it. So we would start like right in the morning, like at breakfast, like she's hungry. Let's try this. And so just trying it like one bottle a day and then gradually increasing it. And then we did find that she likes to be held like we would hold her with a bottle and just use a sippy cup versus it like at the table. So we found out she likes to be held, like cuddled, and then just use a sippy cup. That was just like what works for us is trying to make it the same as a, the routines and stuff that we would use for bottle. And then eventually for a full month, we were only using the sippy cup, the same sippy cup. We just bought it a million times. And, and now after pallet repair, she really likes like the honey bear one with a straw. I think it's also because she sees her big brother and big sister using straws. And so she really wants to use them. Just finding that one cup. We have one cup that we liked before and one cup we liked after and going with that. <laughs> okay. And here is probably the dreaded question that you've answered so many times. What <laughs> sippy cup should be? <laughs> Yeah. And I know it's different for everyone, obviously, but the one we liked was on Amazon. It was like a newbie and it's an open cup like trainer. So it's like an open cup, but also has a little short, very short. So our surgeon was really excited about it. Our team was the one who told us about it. And so that's the one we use. We've also used like the reflow plastic ones, but I definitely think she liked the feeling of the suction, like the silicone in her mouth instead of like hard plastic mm -hmm. um so you just kind of have to because it felt similar more to like, the chewing that she liked and then there's the i think it's the replay ones from like target you can get it i think on amazon now but target and they're like two dollars a cup those are amazing but our surgeon wouldn't let us use it post-op because it was too long mm -hmm. uh the okay. nipple but it's really good to like, use that one to, to teach them to get off the bottle but then and every surgeon's different a lot of people message me and they're like we're going back to bottles after pallet repair every surgeon has their own and it's all about which technique they used and all that stuff and yeah i think that is true i think it's more so they tell you to wean because they don't know until they're actually done with the repair like how the tissue and the anatomy that's there and so i was told to wean so i did get her to drink from a free flow cup so i knew that it would work for um after repair but then when her surgeon saw her after like that morning where when we were being discharged you know when she saw her right after surgery she said I'm okay with her drinking from her bottle like going back to her bottle but with the valve okay. so she doesn't she's not forming any suction still and yeah. so that was a relief and we were able to use the bottle but she after that I don't think she probably used an, another the bottle even like a few weeks like maybe like two weeks later she was off because by then we were already doing some baby led weaning oh yeah, yeah so yeah so she was able to get nutrition from that did you do any baby led weaning at all with brianna yeah we did definitely like a combination which is what i've done with all of my kids and she but she was eating like way before power fire. Like we started this six months, um, her, her picking her food up and doing it on her own. And we never really had a problem with that. She actually was a better eater than my other two kids who are not club affected. But we just would, after a meal, we would make her drink a little bit to clear anything out. But um, yeah, so she was getting most of her nutrition from just like she would eat whatever we were eating. Um, and then we would do some you know, some purees, but a lot of bigger food. And I think it was she just liked the taste of it. She wanted to be eating what her brother and sister were eating too. So um, it w it was helpful for us to do that. That was hard a hard part of our recovery. I definitely ate in the pantry a few times because I didn't want her to see me eating. So we would not have her with us at meal times. Like my husband or I would play with her in her room because she wanted to eat so bad yeah. and it was so hard for her and for my other kids to understand why she couldn't eat with us when she was on liquids only for a week and then when once she could do soft food it was a little bit better but she wanted like the other things my kids were eating so that was hard but it not having her at the table while we were eating was helpful for that that she didn't see the food yeah I can imagine that. 
What about, so someone wrote in the group, please tell me sleep gets better after. <laughs> so what are that's not really. Yeah, I was really worried about that. I, my husband and I were like going to set up a schedule of you stay up one night, I stay up the next. Can like we'll switch halfway through. She went right back to her sleeping really well. So luckily, that was not something we experienced. We did wake her up for medicine in the nighttime, even if she was still sleeping. We would wake her up to eat or to take it at first, um, just to stay on top of the pain medicine. And not get it to like the breakout pain that's really too hard to manage at home. Because then if they're in a lot of pain, they won't drink. And then you get Mm -hmm. issues with dehydration. But yeah, we didn't have any sleep issues. So, I don't know. We've been really lucky with that. Now I'm like going to knock on wood (laughs) because she's still little. You never know. (laughs) Yeah. So we big time. Giselle. So there was a couple of things happening. So like literally the day before her repair she learned how to stand and when they learn a new skill they want to practice and if you don't give them enough time to practice throughout the day they're trying to practice at night and so (laughs) she's standing up and then she knew that something was like off of course because we ended up staying at the ronald mcdonald house again shout out to them the night before because it was just closer to the hospital we would have had to been up at three in the morning it just was like better to stay there one night and then go to the hospital in the morning so we weren't in the she learned how to stand up we weren't really in like her normal setting and then yes and then she obviously had surgery so that was like really tough and so her sleep was all messed up she's always been a great sleeper the one thing that I do share with people though is that you do have I don't know, I guess like a two to four week period. I don't think it gets better until like after four weeks that they don't get up every, like every, I feel like she was like basically a newborn again. Every two hours she was like waking up. So you can expect that to happen. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned pain medicine. How do you, what do you think are like other ways that people can keep them comfortable at home? What's the best ways to do that? Yeah, we held her a lot. I'm very close with my parents. They live down the street from us. And so they were over a lot. Just like, and I would just like, give her to my dad and be like, hey, can you hold her? And she would, he would like read to her for an hour. Like she would, like would sit there and just love it. Just like being able to love on her and hold her up. Just, I felt like that was helpful for us. A lot of music. She loves listening to music. And so just like having, or just like we did like kids music. We can just search whatever on Spotify or something and so we did that to help and then um we did um one thing to keep them more comfortable so the no-nos that our hospital provided us with were way too big and then the the smaller size was way too small and it was a mess and she was so uncomfortable and so I instantly ordered the Amazon arm restraints that I'd seen other people sharing and they were half the size they were so much better we ordered a size small for an 11 month old. That's what we use and it works perfect. And so what we did was we'd get like an oversized onesie that was like her brother's. It was like a 2T. And then we would put the no-nos on. So it was like long sleeve so that wasn't scratching her or anything. And then we would fold up since the arms were so long from like the 2T, 3T, we'd fold it up and then I would sometimes duct tape it or whatever. So it was like really cushioned. Aww. And she couldn't get to it because a lot of the kids will learn how to undo the no-no. So that way, if it was like duct taped or just rolled up, then she couldn't get to the little strap to undo it. And that helped me sleep a lot. And for just knowing that she was not going to get to her mouth at all. But that was one of the way we kept her calm and comfortable was to order. They were like $20 and they were the best $20 we spent to have. So it still did the same thing. But it wasn't painful or itching or like scratching her. Yeah. So, and the physical barrier helped with that too. Gotcha. So someone else asked, has, can anyone share their experience having their baby's hearing tested post pallet repair? And what should I expect and how is it conducted? Did you, did Brianna have her, she had that recently, right? With the, they usually yeah. do it with well, the, they pair it with the ENT appointment. They do audiologists and then ENT, right? Yeah. So she 
failed every single hearing test before she got her tubes placed. She did like a non-sedated ABR so they could see that she could hear it was just the fluid. But she wasn't able to pass no matter what. They did like really intense hearing tests in that NICU and she still was I was a very freak out moment for us because they kept saying she's failing it in both ears, like extreme level, like very like low. It was like as soon as she had her ear tubes placed, then they redid her hearing. And so we were scheduled to do a whole ABR, which is where they like attach it to their brain and attach like a bunch of different measuring devices and they have to be asleep for it. So it's harder as they get older. And so she, we were scheduled to do that to make sure that she was in normal ranges again. But then they ended up doing just like the one where they put it in her ears and she could see that she passed that. And they just like send sound and it like gives them the reading. So it's not like, obviously they're too little to like explain what right. if they can hear or not. We just had like another assessment and she was able to see that she passed in both ears, completely normal range. Um, and so that was actually after her lip repair. It was about a month after lip repair to give the tubes time to drain all that inner ear fluid. And um, so we haven't had them tested. That was a Gibson like and so now it's July and we haven't had them tested again, but we're going back to have them tested. They just said once a year to test it. But yeah, it was pretty immediate that it was able to be improved. And then just it was a really simple five minutes. Yeah. Did you notice any differences? I know, for example, with Giselle. So Giselle actually has to have her tubes replaced on the 30th August. And it's because one of them is completely out probably some pamper like in her room and then the other one is out of her ear but it's blocking her eardrum so well and yeah. yeah they can tell they can see it but it's just so obviously if yeah. you put your finger over your ear you're gonna have some you're not gonna be able to hear it fully so they know yeah. she has some some loss but it's not like true loss as you like explain it's just that's there either yeah. or the actual tube but yeah. it's so interesting because she hears everything to me you know it's just, <laughs> yeah that's because like Obviously, my house is very loud with a three-year-old boy and a six-year-old all the time. And so, like, w even though she was failing these tests and they were like, she's failing, she would startle, like, when she was asleep. Like, we knew she could hear. And what they explained is that, like, she is hearing, but that it sounds like she's underwater because the frequency, like, she can't hear the pitch and the sounds of the word, the letters, mm -hmm. things like that. And so she could hear sound. It just was so muffled that she wouldn't. For speech, it's hard for her to pick up what people are saying. And that's how they learn at that age is by listening and things like that. So, yeah, I did notice a difference after her tubes. And now she's saying a million words. Like today, she said, like, thank you and hot dog. And I'm like, <laughs> what? Hot dog? Are you kidding me? That's like, <laughs> we guess I eat a lot of hot dogs. But <laughs> yeah, so I noticed a difference. But I also, when she was fa continually failing these tests, I could still tell that she was hearing. She just wasn't hearing the sound that they need to hear to acquire speech. And that's why I advocated to do it early. And my team agreed because some, it was at our clinic, at least in Texas, they typically do it at pal repair, the ear tubes for the cleft affected kids who might need it. Not everyone does, but because she consistently was failing and such high rate, I advocated to get it in early and everybody agreed. So yeah. I think I advocated because I was really worried about that as well. One of the things, those are two things that I really worried about. Like thinking back on it now, it's not that deep, but like I was really worried about speech. And I was really worried about hearing. And of course, those two things go hand in hand. For sure. But yeah, that's one of those two things I was like really concerned about. And then that's why, just to call back to what we were talking about earlier, that's why I had her evaluated twice because I'm like, no, she's going to need speech. And I just don't. I just didn't want her yeah. to fall through the cracks. Like, I didn't want her to yeah. not get what she needed. Um, yeah. And every state has their own version of ECI, like an early childhood program. And it is very common that children who are born with clefts are automatic qualifiers for that. And so, like, I reached out to, right when she was born, to our ECI team and tried to get her evaluated. And what was interesting is they said, yes, she is an automatic qualifier, but just because she's an automatic qualifier doesn't mean that she automatically qualifies for services. She still has to show a deficit. And at that point, she wasn't showing any, she was doing what she was supposed to be doing as far as swallowing and eating. 
And, but it is a really great resource to, you know, to use if you want, and it's for all families. A lot of people think it has like an income level or anything, but it's all families. We used it with my son. He was born with torticol, really severe torticollis and needed physical therapy from birth. And nobody else would do physical therapy on a newborn except like the ECI people would help us. It's a really great resource to check out in your state if you're in the United States. Yeah, for sure. I also, that was another one of the uh, resources that I used to get just all evaluated. So when we went to an external like speech, like uh, pathologist, and they said, bring her back at 15 months or 18 months because she's doing fine at 15 months. And so I didn't really believe them. So that's where I got her evaluated. It was at, I think it's birth to three or something like yeah. that. Yeah. And so they evaluated her as well. And they were like, yeah, Laura. And then I guess I got her evaluated three times because then the <laughs> speech pathologist at her cleft appointment, yeah. they do their yeah. usual evaluation. And they said, yeah, Laura, she's doing well. So that was great to hear. And I think that even with her having one tube blocking her ear and one of them out, she's still doing very well in terms of speech. And I guess hearing, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> it's, hard, it's really hard to know and the thing with like birth to three and then they can also transition them there to get services at your local elementary school including like, sometimes they can get free preschool depending on your state and depending on and like services there with their CLP which is a great resource too if you need it and of course I was talking to our team about that if she would need that and they're like as of this point she doesn't we're just going to keep watching it but I know that it's a great resource to be able to have to start working with a speech teacher that she, they might work with in kindergarten, but like when they're pre-K. So that's like another resource that most all states have too. Yeah, for sure. So there are moms that reach out to Gina like all the time, every day. So I wanted to ask if there's any like questions that you've got recently related to pallet repair that maybe we didn't talk about yet. No, I think... You hit the biggest questions that people ask. People want to know like what recovery is like. And I think for me, the, we've all been through the newborn stage. And I think if you equate a surgery to being like you're in the newborn stage where it's helpful to have meals prepped, cancel your schedule. Don't try to be going to your Bible study with your friends. Like you're going to need to be full time with your kids or with whoever just had surgery. I think if you mentally say this is like coming home from the hospital, like you're in, you're maybe not in physical pain as you are when you give birth, but you're emotionally, it's hard. So you have to take care of yourself, whatever that means. Like, yeah. Ask for help, have a meal train. Maybe if you're close with a lot of neighbors, whatever you can that you would have done it just to get your house ready. We did before we left, we had set up like a little station where we had like the oversized uh, shirts set up. We had the medicines all lined up. I had the little piece of paper that I had what time we had to do the medicines, what medicine, like just get everything a like ahead of time, what you would need set. So it's just, just like a newborn time. So that was like the, the one thing. And then I think the other thing that I try to remind moms a lot is that every child with the cleft and every child is different. And so it's very, for me at least, anxiety producing and just difficult to hear all the different stories of everyone of we got power repair at 10 months and we got power repair at 18 months. And my surgeon says you have to do it before 12 months or this. And then you're like, oh no, what happens to me? Everyone does it. Every team does it differently for a reason. Like every surgeon is trained differently. And so even on our team, we're in the largest children's hospital in the country. We have a ton of surgeons on our team. Every single surgeon does it different. Every single surgeon has a different timeline. Every single surgeon has different recovery requirements. Even like when we were talking to a nurse practitioner, she's like, who's your surgeon again? Because I can't give you, like, I have to give you specific advice based on who your surgeon is. And so I think it's just important to remember that every child is different for a reason and that you're getting individualized care. So rather than freaking out of, oh, no, we should have, I should have done the power repair earlier or I should have done this different, just being like, no, 
we're getting individualized care with the best team who has seen my child, who's looked in my child's mouth. They know what they're doing. Like, put the faith in them. And that is really helpful because I know a lot of moms get like very, I get a lot of messages of my team is not doing it how your team is doing it. And now I'm worried. <laughs> and I just want to reassure people that I know I felt that too. Like I always assumed that it was better to get the lip repair done early. And when our team's, yeah, we'll do it at five and a half months. I was like, what? Some people are doing it three months. Why can't you do it at three months? And they're like, no, for bilateral cases, it's different. So I think that just to really take a step back and try not to get too caught up and on the comparison mm. between other kids and other teams. and in the world too. I know it's very different in a lot of places in the world and it's all for a reason and it's all for good. Yeah. So, and I always try to yeah. ask if I have a surgeon on, I ask, I always ask that question, like what why do you do it during that time frame that you do it at? And and what is the time frame that they do it at? And why? And what's the, yeah, like reasoning? Yeah. What's the reasoning behind? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, and knowing that having, I always have a note on my phone of questions to ask the next appointment. And I just always keep it a running list. And, and I also think like remembering that this is an art and a science, not just a science. Like it is definitely medicine is unique to the surgeon and unique to the child. And just because I know it's very easy to get caught up in what's the best way to do. Everyone wants what's best for their child. I think it's very common. I see this asked a lot on the cleft groups. Who's the best surgeon in the United States <laughs> for cleft repair? And immediately it's like always the most popular post immediately it's like 87 people write their surgeon yeah which is great and i'm so happy that everyone loves their surgeon and there are a few like larger hospitals that like present research and things like that that like they have whatever people will call to be evaluated for special cases and stuff every person is going to say their own surgeon and so it's just believe in your team and and you also have a right i know a lot of people ch can change teams too if they don't feel like they're, you have that, if you don't feel like your team is listening to you or if they are not producing results, you're allowed to switch or go somewhere else. And I know like Shriners is a great system that will pay, they will help pay your transportation costs if you need to go to one and you don't have one near you. So there's definitely options if you feel like your team maybe isn't listening or you're not receptive to, to the way that they're gonna progress with your care or something yeah i like that tip because i think sometimes we're not we don't feel empowered to do that like to change teams i think even for me i just went with unc because giselle was born at unc but had i if i had time and everything worked out right they've been great to me but if i had more time i feel like to think about where her care should be i would probably know more about duke is the other team that that does have care here so yeah. I would have done more research on them and I actually have a friend um, that just recently had, had was given her diagnosis um, her baby is going to be born with a unilateral cleft uh, lip and they're thinking that it's going to be palate as well and she's also going to be born at UNC but she decided to go with the Duke team so they had uh, we actually just recently went to an event together they had a really like she was sold based on the community that they built around their program, which I think is really endearing. Fistulas. Was that something that is like a big like concern for you based on what you've seen or heard? What is the whole thing about fistulas? Yes. So I was very concerned about fistulas and I was very upfront about my concern to them, to the surgeon. And she, they track the fistula rates at hospitals and you can ask what your individual surgeon's rate is and things like that. She reassured me that it is very uncommon to have a fistula at like the complete top. That's what they're really concerned about. Like the whole thing opens up. And, and so she was saying that's very rare for that to happen, which thankfully did not happen to her hard palate. Everything looks really great there. But then she did let me know that they built, at least my surgeon, built in some really small fistulas on purpose behind her front teeth mm -hmm. that will be closed at the bone graft. And so she warned me, so you may still see some liquids coming down, not that often, but 
sometimes happens and that's normal and that's okay. And that's how the, des- like how she designed it. Mm-hmm. Now, I don't know if all surgeons do that, but she says she does it to allow the other teeth to come in, things like that. And that it wouldn't be 100% closed until bone graft, which is like sometime between six and eight. And for us, and I think that helped me to know, because I remember the first time we saw some liquid coming down, I was devastated after her repair because I thought, oh, great, here's a a huge fistula. A lot of people reached out to me about fistulas. They're very common, not to the extent that like they have to redo the whole surgery. A lot of them are so small that they either close on their own or they close them at a subsequent surgery later. So the little, they're calling it like a blip at the end, at the the back of her mouth. It's going to be closed later, but it's not affecting it. So a lot of the fistulas are like that, where they're so small. I know a lot of cleft adults still have them and like rice can come down their nose, but they learn how to eat where that doesn't happen. So yeah, I think it's a lot of people have like holes develop and a lot of times the mouth as they grow closes back up. So that is helpful. And to know that just because you have it doesn't mean it's going to cause issues. So. Yeah, I, with Bri- and Brianna's case is the one in the back of her mouth is would that be considered a fistulum? Or they're just I don't know. She didn't consider it a fistula because it's not a hole. It's just like the a separation. split. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's separation. So it's like a hole that developed. So I'm not really sure. Yeah, but, it's um, kind of insightful though about the built-in like fistulas at the right up right outside of I guess the hard palate is what you mm-hmm. heard because like, I think so many people yeah it said hey there's still you know stuff coming out what's going on and so I think the way that your surgeon designed understanding the way that your surgeon designed the the incision or did the repair is really important so that you freak yeah. out yeah. yeah and I think I only learned that because I asked her so I asked a million questions and I think I just asked like what do I do if liquid comes out yeah. or her nose? Like, does that, you know, and she said, like, this is before the surgery happened. And she's like, oh, no, that still might happen because she's going to have a little bit there. And that's just how she designed. It. There's a ton. You can actually look up all the different. And like I asked our surgeon, what technique do you use to close? Because there's different types of, as you talked about, different types of repairs that each surgeon chooses to do. And yeah, I think that like, it's just empowering to know that and to know it's going to be okay, even if there's a little fistula. doesn't always mean another surgery. Um, and it doesn't always mean that it's going to not close on its own. Yeah. Okay. I know another big thing for you was keeping Brianna healthy so that her surgery wouldn't get canceled. <laughs> yes. How did you keep her from getting sick? And what's your recommendation for other moms? <laughs> Yeah, that's a really good question. And that was something that definitely stressed me out for a long time. And so our team suggested a little bit that they said, hey, we've had a lot of surgeries canceled, especially in the cold and flu season. I actually got a call and they were like, hey, do you want to come in in a few hours for surgery? Because we just had a cancellation. So what we did is we tried to, as much as possible, minimize our exposure to germs in ways that we could. So, for example, like we stopped bringing Brianna to the child care at church and we because there was just a bunch of snotty kids and the, in the same room and all touching the stuff. And so we thought, you know what, just for a month or so, we can watch it online. And and then with my daughter, who was going to kindergarten, which is, of course, a germ central we as soon as she got home we had her just like practice good like hand hygiene we would have I had a lot of nurses tell me when I asked on Instagram like how do I help keep my family from getting sick in cold and flu season they would recommended changing her clothes as soon as she got home so we did that and then we all were like supplementing with elderberry and like vitamin C and I don't know if that helped or not but it made me feel better that we were doing something just trying to like do get enough sleep and try to not be stressed and try to eat nutrient dense things like we were trying to do everything we could to just keep our body strong fighting immunity um yeah so we really were really careful with our decisions not to go to big play areas with a lot of kids that are inside like mcdonald's place something like that which is like germ central so we did that for about a month and it ended up because i really wanted her to have it before her first birthday 
I wanted, we had a joint birthday party planned with my sister has twins that are a month apart from Brianna. And so we wanted all to celebrate together. And I just didn't want everything to be delayed. And I just, it's something that we wanted to get through and I didn't want the delays. And yeah, because it is more of a airway restriction surgery, like they were very, we had to go and prove that she wasn't sick a few days before because they don't want anything like oxygen with congestion. They said with lip repair, it's not as important, but because of the nature of the surgery and how far back they go, things like that, she was not. But interestingly enough, I was very like shocked. We get there and they do a little pre-assessment and they're like, oh yeah, she's a double ear infection. And I had no idea. She wasn't sick. She had no, but she was, she gets a lot of ear infection fluid. And so they're like, yeah, just it's fine because she's not congested because she's not sick. She just has a double ear infection. We can still do the surgery. But we were like minutes away from sending her back. And they were like, yeah, double ear infection. And anyway, so, yeah, that was it was definitely worth it, I think, to do those extra steps of just trying to keep us. Sometimes sicknesses happen and they know that, but they were very upfront. If anything happens, call us immediately so we can somebody else in there. Oh, yeah. and reschedule it. So, yeah. Oh, it's, it wouldn't have been so hard if we didn't have two other kids who are also bringing stuff. Yeah. But my, I was my son, quarantine and everything. They really, and my husband would, he got, was able to work from home. He like for just a few days, like not the whole time, but he was on, he just told everyone at work, like what we were going through and they were also supportive. So I think just like the other thing is just really getting your whole village or just being really upfront and honest about what you guys are going through so people can help you, support you, let you work from home or whatever you need to do to make this an easier time for your family. Is there anything else we can think of that like people ask all the time? The most important is just like knowing what to expect. So all the what to expect of like how long is it going to be? One thing that was a huge shock to me that I try to warn parents of. And maybe I was just super naive, but I didn't know that after she came out of surgery, we would be in a huge room with 50 other children who would all come out of surgery. Maybe it's just because our hospital is the largest hospital in the country. It is for children. It is huge. And there was just a lot of people and a lot of pain, a lot of parents hearing hard information. And I was not prepared. I thought it was going to, I thought when I'd see her for the first time, we were going to be in our own private room. Mm -hmm. I did not know it was going to be like a huge room of like just a lot of chaos. And so it was not like, I wasn't prepared to what I was walking into. And I kind of like, and sometimes like kids coming out of anesthesia is not easy. There's a lot, sometimes like moaning and just Mm -hmm. stuff like that. And so I, it was a really emotionally, really hard time. And I was prepared for that with my palate repair, was not prepared for lip repair. And so I think a lot of people want to know, like, tell me the nitty gritty of what it's actually going to be like. Because your team, I don't know, at least for us, they didn't really walk us through that. And I think maybe not to scare us, but want to know what is it going to be like? At least I did. And yeah, I think for them also, it's not that they approach it this way, because I know my team was very compassionate in, in their care. But I think for them, they maybe don't remember because it's really like another day on the job and it's like you your view and perspective of things are so different I actually had a different reaction and now I like feel bad because like when I went when I turned the corner and I like saw Giselle I actually didn't even I wasn't we were in open room as well but I didn't notice any of the other (laughs) babies oh really no I think we just got placed by some really difficult kid and it it was just like you could hear stuff and it was they were all there was not even like a curtain mm-hmm. see right next to you so I just think it was yeah difficult but yeah yeah she was the thing too is all she was she I could t- like she wanted to jump out of that bed like to come like to my arms and stuff so it was like a moment and my heart was beating so fast so it's just like a, a thing but yeah okay anything else we can think of I think it's helpful to just know going into it that you will get through it. It will be hard. You will be stronger on the other side. It's something that like a lot of cleft moms have talked about is like they have a really special and really deep connection. Like it helps build that really deep connection with not that you don't have that with your other children, but 
because you go through something together, maybe slightly traumatizing, but you go through it together and you are stronger on the other side. So I think just like having the confidence that you will provide the best care for your child and that you will get through it. I know for me, I felt an immense sense of relief after it was done, like even just passing her off and knowing that like when I get her back, because this is a surgery we've been worried about for so long and just knowing that you'll get through it. And that was really helpful and powerful for me to know that like this, we checked this off, like this is on her list of things she had to have done in her life and we checked it off. It felt really good. It was something you don't want to have to go through, but knowing that you're going to have to go through it to be on the other side. It does feel like encouraging and empowering and to be proud of your child for all that they've overcome. And just to reflect on that was really helpful for me. And to bring more snacks than you need. Thank you. <laughs> bring more snacks. My husband and I, we didn't want to leave the waiting room. I know a lot of people like, like to go on walks or to go to the cafeteria, but we just like, camped out. We like set up a little TV and little on our iPad and just got through it. Yeah. And that there are moms out there that want to help you to know that there's a community out here that it's, it's all, I answer questions all day long and it makes me feel so happy to know that um, I can provide that for someone because I know I needed that when I got our diagnosis and was walking through it. So and there were lots of cleft moms ahead of me that did the same thing for me. So yeah just always thankful for everyone yeah for sure all right that's actually all i think we have for you all today if you have additional questions for us please feel free to let us know reach out gina's always answering questions i'm always answering questions as well we would love to do a part two if we need to that would be great and we'll continue to talk about these topics yeah do you have anything that's pressing that we didn't address today we'd be happy to help you and support you Thank you so much, Gina, for joining us again. Of course, anytime. Thanks so much. <laughs> and thank you all for listening to the Our Forever Smiles, Clef Mom Diaries and Support podcast. Be sure to subscribe and submit a review wherever you listen to podcasts. I hope that you have enjoyed this audio experience. Maybe you laughed a little, cried a little, but more importantly, I hope that you feel a little piece of reassurance and even joy in your journey. Talk to you next week. <laughs>